Hey everybody, this is Al. I'm not far from the University of Pennsylvania where the Kelly Writers House sits quietly nested and empty, sadly, for the moment. But uh, we're channeling the Writers House, all of us. I'm here maybe 10 blocks away in West Philadelphia and I'm joined by so many of my friends. In fact, a lot of us, you wouldn't know this, but a lot of us haven't seen each other in a few months. So it's kind of a reunion. Um, I'm going to say hello to everybody here uh, so they can say hi to you as well. I'm going to repeat the phone number which you can call and also the Skype handle. Chris Martin, do we call that a handle when it's Skype? Yeah, handle, username. Handle, username, Skype. I'm gonna do that. Then I'm gonna have a uh, start with a few announcements and then we're gonna get started with your questions and interests. Um, we're hoping you'll wanna talk about week one poems um, but if you have questions about ModPo generally, uh, please uh, ask. Uh, so, and we'll, we're also going to identify who among us is going to be checking the various places where you can pose your questions. So, first, hellos. So, Lily Applebaum is there somewhere. Where's Lily? Hi, oh, hi, Lily. Hi, How are you? It's good to see you. Anna, Anna's here somewhere. And there's a new, T, a new TA, MTA, mini TA. <laughs> and we're going to, no doubt you will get to meet the MTA at some point. <laughs> Dave Poplar is here. Uh, temperatures have dipped below 100 degrees in Arizona. Hey, Dave. Yeah, it's freezing in here right now. I'm great. How are you? What did you it's say? Freezing right now. Oh, freezing. Okay. You should turn your AC down. Jess is here. Hello, Jess. Hey. Jess is here for year two. We are so pleased that you wanted to come back. Last year was an experiment, a special fellowship. And then you thought, I can't do an autumn without ModPo. I guess that's kind of what you thought, right? Exactly. See. Amber Rose Johnson is here. Got the Skippy. Is it Skippy? You have to unmute yourself. It is Skippy, and I wish, usually, you know, I try to get peanut butter that's like in a glass jar and yeah. locally made, but now you've exposed that I'm eating Skippy right now. I have had, sorry, I called you out. I, I'm, this, one of the saddest things about not being able to go to the writer's house to do these things is that ARJ always brings me a little something to boost my energy. Thanks a lot. It's good to see you. And Gabe is here from Chicago. Hello. Hi, Gabe. How are you? I'm good. I'm glad to be here. Good to see you. And Davey Niddle is here. Hey, Hello, I'm Davey. And I just saw Max join us. Wow. And Jake Marmer is here from Palo Alto, uh, also dealing with heat. I heard it was 100 in San Francisco, which seems impossible. Um, it went down last night, so that's good. Good. And your sky is orange from all the fires, but we're glad that you could join us. Allie I'm Castleman not. is here from Manhattan somewhere or Brooklyn. Hi, Al. Good to see you. And Jason Zoska is here. Hello, Jason. You're muted, Jason. I'll come back to you so you can say hi after unmuting. And Max McKenna is here. Hey, Max. And hi. Er hi, hi, Jason and Max. And Erica Kaufman is here. What, and there's other, there, hey, hey Erica, there are other TAs who weren't able to join us today. There are a couple of TAs who are sitting out for the season, but they may make some guest appearances. So we're all here. The number that you can call anytime, really, Chris Martin will answer the phone. And if we're not ready to take your call, just hang on with Chris, chat with him. That number is 610-616-3208, 610 610-616. 3208. And if you're the third caller, we'll give you a set of new knives that we're going to sharp. No, we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I was thinking it was, I was channeling the, you know, late night uh, hawking shows. I don't know what we're going to give you, but anyway, call. It'll be fun. You'll get the pleasure of our company. And for those of you uh, tuning in internationally, and I know a number of people in the U UK have started to rely on this because it's a free call, Skype to modpo pen, one word, modpo, P-E-N-N, -N, and that will give you a free access basically to the same thing. The magic of Chris Martin's audio skills will get you in. Um, so uh, checking the forums, we have a discussion forum thread that is devoted to this 
uh, to this webcast, some of you have already posted there, will be Anna Strong Safford. Uh, checking the tortilla, no, it's Twitter, will be Lily Applebaum. Um, we are tweeting at, the, the hashtag is um, hashtag modpo live. Mod no, I'm doing YouTube. Oh, you're not doing uh, tortilla also? How come? <laughs> well, it's a little hard to. <laughs> okay, I need somebody else to do Twitter. I need a volunteer to do Twitter. You'll you'll come forward. We're tweeting at. Uh, all you have to do is indicate us at hashtag modpo live, and our handle is mod under. What is our handle, Lily? It's modpo pen, I think. Yep. So we, we that's that. It's always good to link us there too, so we'll get to see it later. That's Twitter. Uh, Chris is on the phones, as mentioned. Lily's going to be checking the uh, the discussion thread conversation at the YouTube site, which is how most of you are watching us. And Amber Rose Johnson will be checking Facebook. That's the Modpo, uh, what do we call that? Mm. Group? Group. I what it's called. The Modpo group, which is yeah. 10,000 people. And she'll be checking that. Okay, thank you all. A um, couple of announcements and then we'll move on. First of all, currently today and yesterday, there has been called somewhat hastily but effectively an academic work stoppage. Some people have called it a strike in Canada and the US in particular, um, in solidarity with those who are, have been and are active in the effort to achieve racial justice. And um, we, a lot of academics are not doing academic work. We pondered whether we should not go ahead and host our, um, our webcast, but we decided to because this effort of community outreach uh, to a diverse community all across the world seems to us to be adjacent to academic work and very much in line, aligned with the values of, expressed by those who called for the work stoppage um, to urge academics not to be so stuck in the bubble of academia, but actually to reach out and to be public teachers, which is what we think we are. But I want to take a pause before some further announcements to ask if any of my colleagues want to add a word about the work stoppage or about Modpo in relation to it. Um, I know that Davy and I have talked about this already, so maybe Davy would start with a comment. Sure. I mean, the, the thing that it occurs to me to say briefly about this is that the best version of Modpo in my mind is a version that really is co-constituted where we're thinking together. And I think that the academic work stoppage asks us to not only um, think about the way that universities can offer public resources, but to make those public resources uh, take universities to, tack for, um, for, to task for institutionalized racism. And I think that if we can um, approach the Modpo curriculum this year uh, and really ask what it allows us to um, talk about in terms of systems of power, um, that's a that's a useful job that we can do, and I think that it is not only making a public resource out of university material, but using that resource to talk about how power works. That's our job here, and I think that we can continue that throughout symposium mode. Davy, thank you. I don't can't imagine anybody who could have said it any better and more powerfully than that. Thank you. Um, as I turn to see if any of my colleagues also want to add a word about this and do so either in the chat room or just waving at me. Um, I just wanna point out that sometime in these 11 webcasts weekly, that's 10 weeks plus the final words, I would love for us to come back to the issue of what a massive open online course is, a free one, and how it stands uh, tentatively in relation to the main work of the university um, and what we think about that. And for those of you inside academia, which is probably about half of you, you know, how you feel about this project and what difference it makes and so forth. I just want to return to that. I don't want to take up too much of week one to do that, but it is, as David suggests, fundamentally underneath almost everything that we talk about. I would invite one more person to comment on the academic work stoppage or the values of it. Is anybody interested? Gabe, please. Yeah, I just want to say something about the kind of broader context, which is I can say that the American University, which is already dealing with a big kind of um, crisis moment from the COVID stuff, is also at the same time dealing with a kind of internal, external and a viral conversation about um, its role in anti-racism efforts and in racism in, um, in the United States and Canada. 
as well as how the university has like gained much of its power and cultural standing through racism. Um, so this is not, this kind of work stoppage that's happening is not the only effort, I can say at least from UChicago that there's a large discussion amongst graduate students and amongst faculty about how to kind of get different departments to use their resources differently, to approach admissions differently, to approach learning and conferences and all these parts, because universities are just these really big animals. And so these conversations happen um, in little pieces and in a big way. But I think one of the good things about this kind of work stoppage is a forcing a conversation about how to use our resources differently. Mm. So that's all. Thank you. Um, I, I have been going back to 2012. Oh, we have the MTA joining us. So that's great. Thank you, Adam. When there's the right moment, you'll introduce us to Sylvie. Um, I, I've been going back to 2012, which is the kind of the so-called year of the MOOC, certainly when ModPo began with 50, 52,000 enrollees that first year. Um, and I've been studying the attacks on the MOOC by all kinds of people within the academy, um, attacks on it. And it's very, I don't wanna to get too far into it now, but it's very interesting to see that the logics there uh, they went undercover for a while and then they're, now they're back. But the um, racial justice, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, movements have caused us to see what we're doing here and the pandemic has caused us to see what we're doing here as very progressive, which I think it always was, but it was attacked because it seemed like university's way of ditching uh, faculty appointments and getting around tenure and so forth. It's a very complicated story, but we're still here nine years later. Um, I wanted to shout out to new ModPo people. Many of, many of the people watching this webcast are new to ModPo this year. Um, and there are now 49,614 people enrolled in the course. That's not the number of people who are going to be active or who are active. Lots of people are getting the, the messages I send every day and so caught up in uh, taking care of family or of trying to stay with their jobs and uh, dealing with ill family members or just really run out of time every day they intend to get more involved. Um, but a lot of people are involved through the Facebook group and not even inside the site by watching the webcast 49,614. We are overwhelmed. We're not just proud of what we've built that could attract so many people. We're proud of the fact that we maintain that this is free, that nobody has to pay for it. We're proud that we've built something that you can go in and out of, and we wanna stress that later when I ask for recommendations for how to stay with the course. Um, and, and really proud of a lot of people who are defying the odds to participate in whatever way they can. And I wanna shout out to two people. Um, and just before I do, I'll repeat that the number to call is 610-616-3208 and the Skype is modpo pen 6106163208. So I want to shout out to two people that I've met this week. Uh, one is uh, Danny Witty. Many of you have seen Danny's post. Uh, Danny responded to I dwell in possibility. Um, <clears throat> I'll read in part what they said here. Uh, this poem, I dwell in possibility, really spoke to my perspective as an autistic, apraxic, minimally speaking man. The imagery of her, Dickinson's, dwelling in the world of possibility is akin to the constrained yet limitless world of my autistic mind. Skipping a little bit, the line and for an everlasting roof, the gambrels of the sky is evocative of the infinite wonder in my mind. Yet the notion of the impregnable chamber speaks to the challenges of being understood or not understood as the case may be by the outside world. Skipping a little more, the visitors are those thoughts that fly into our minds. They need no doors to open. They freely enter and keep me company. The gathering of paradise is exactly what I do in my autistic house. The, the routine, rule-filled, prosaic world outside is so restricting, yet my limitless world must exist within it. In a minute, I'll invite a couple of you to comment on that. Um, for the moment, I want to turn to say hello to another first timer, but I'll just say that Danny was invited to participate. Danny reached, was reached by um, 
another uh, an, another longtime uh, participant uh, in Modpo, uh, whom we know, Dan Bergman, who is also a CTA now, and got got in touch with Danny through a group that uh, that Dan is part of, and Danny took the plunge and is is participating, and I imagine is watching this webcast. So hello to Danny and thank you to Dan. Um, and fine, second second and last. Uh, a, a hello to Rochelle Sushil. Uh, uh, Rochelle uh, is in uh, Jakarta, uh, first time in Modpo. Uh, says that the course has been illuminating so far, really enjoyed the discussions on Dickinson and Whitman. Grateful to you and the TAs for the work it's taken to make this possible. And then Rochelle says something about the brain within its groove that is so, so smart. I just wanted to repeat it. So Rochelle was interested in enjambment. Notice that just when the poem starts to flow, like the current that destroys the mills, like the brain that's overflowing in a direction that cannot be stopped, so the lines start to flow. Now I've been thinking about this poem for a lot of years and I was startled, maybe I've thought about it before, but not often. This is an amazing comment for Rochelle to suggest that the enjambment starts when the poem flows. She says, I think this speaks to the idea of the inability to tame or direct one's thoughts when they have chosen a direction toward which they want to go, thus strengthening a view of Mod Po that works generally in the course, which is that we admire poems that actually do as words, as forms, they actually do what they say as content. How a poem says what it says is more important than what it says. In this case, Rochelle has identified enjambment as a tool for letting the mind of that poem on its own flow. So, Rochelle, thank you and welcome to Modpo. I would invite any of our TAs to say anything they want about either of those comments, but particularly about Danny's reading of uh, The Everlasting Roof, The Gambrel of the Sky in I Dwell in Possibility, or if you just want to welcome Danny and say hello and thank him for the comment. Who would like to say something? Gabe. Well, I want to, well, first I'll say hi um, to everybody. Um, secondly, um, I also will say, one of the things I want to mention is just how much technology is here with us and how much technology is between somebody like Danny or really anybody in the course and us and how much that helps. Because one of the things that ModPo does great is how it kind of overcomes its massive scale like just the fact that we have people all over the world, the fact that we're able to kind of gather here together, even though we're all in different parts, the way that there's conversations happening at just amazing um, sort of timelines. And, you know, somebody like Dan Bergman also really relies on a technological um, means of, of getting, um, you know, his presence presented to us. Uh, and we all rely on that in some way. And I think one of the things that's good about ModPo is that it like works really hard on some of these accessibility things. Um, and on the current of accessibility in a different sense, like it's a course that I think you can take a lot of ways, like you can do a lot with it. You can kind of customize it in a sense. Like it's, I was joking with Lily that we've become almost encyclopedic. So if you were like really committed, you can get, you can get deep into this, but you can also kind of skim the top of it and get so much out of it. So just, just I think those two messages, just from the poems that they've talked about, we already have a lot there. Fantastic. Um, in, in Twitter, uh, John Sweeney writes, Danny gets Emily big time. And uh, T. Dillis Reyes from the Philippines, and it must be about 1 a.m. there, uh, says, defying the odds in order to be with Mod Pope Pen again at this point, an essential pursuit of happiness um, Lily, are you seeing anything interesting in the YouTube feed? Well, guess who's there in the YouTube with us? We have both Dan Bergman uh, and Danny. Um, really? Danny. Wow. They have both um, said hi, and um, <laughs> Danny says, I'm famous. <laughs> oh, Danny, um, famous. Danny, this is just beginning. You're famous just uh, beginning. You're amazing. <laughs> So I'm really uh, glad that um, you guys are both here with us in the YouTube chat and back in the course again. Um, wow. Bergman, yeah. That is cool. Amber Rose Johnson, anything happening in Facebook? 
Um, no, just some friends logging in and saying, hey, some folks that we are familiar with. Eleni is here, Allison, our good friend Mandana, Nicole Braun. Oh, right. Just saying hi. Well, that's, I'm glad we're checking Facebook. And um, Ray Maxwell has taken a screenshot of the team and has posted it to Twitter. So everybody's looking at that, although they could be looking at this and get it. Uh, 610-616-3208. The poems this week are in the main syllabus. Uh, Emily Dickinson's I Dwell in Possibility. Emily Dickinson's Tell All the Truth But Tell It Slant. Emily Dickinson's The Brain Within Its Groove. Some canto selected from Walt Whitman's Song of Myself and Divya Victor's contemporary response, actually quite recent in, in a, a recent book, Kith. W is for Walt Whitman's soul and lots and lots and lots in Mod Po Plus. So Erica Kaufman, sorry to, to spontaneously ask, but you know, you're, you're hanging out with late modern and contemporary poetry and going back to Dickinson and Whitman every year and Mod Po is kind of a return to old friends. Um, what's it like? What's Dickinson become for you? through returning through Mod Pod. Is, is Dickinson as significant as we make her out to be? I'll make a, a confession, Al, which is that when I first joined Mod Po, I was definitely not super into Dickinson. I know that that might be scandalous to admit. You know, I love Whitman. Whitman's been very important to me. And Dickinson, I never quite knew what to do with. And I would say that each year I find myself more and more obsessed with her. Like, I feel like she's one of those writers that it took me a while to find my way in, but now that I'm in it, like I can't quite get out. And um, I find myself turning particularly to I Dwell in Possibility in a lot of different contexts. Like I was planning my course for the semester and I was trying to think about like the activities I wanted my students to do. And I ultimately settled on something that I'm calling gathering, you know, a gathering of paradise um, where, you know, we're going to make these mini anthologies. But, you know, it seems like Dickinson is suddenly walking into my world in a way that she wasn't, you know, six or seven years ago. Dave Poplar, what does it mean to, to stick with a poet that long? In Erica's case, some years in Mod Po, sounds like at a certain point she didn't get into Dickinson, found us, and, you know, is now into it. I'm sure there were other reasons. What's it like? What, what is it about poetry that makes you want to stick with it for years and years and get, as you might call it, a return on investment of time? Yeah, I always, I always say that, that Dickinson, and, and well, especially Wallace Stevens, has great ROI because the longer you stick with it, the more you can extract from it. Just going back to it a year later, it's amazing. It becomes a completely different poem almost that you see things that you had never seen before. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to say that you get that experience from uh, novels to the same extent. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, there's just such uh, density in, po in poetry and especially in certain poems in poets like Dickinson, I think. So yeah, yeah I think there's great value Back in 2012, Davy Niddle, we, uh, we recorded a two-part uh, episode of this reality TV show on uh, the brain within its groove. And we talked, I don't know if we used the terminology of non-neurotypical, but we certainly addressed that issue right there. I mean, it was, it's really clear that that's how we read the poem. Um, I'm going to read you a tweet, Davy, and ask you and um, maybe Jake Marmer to respond to it. Uh, someone who goes under phantom numbers in, uh, in Twitter. Uh, it's great how Modpo amplifies non-neurotypical voices. Big up, Dan and Danny. Now that wasn't a comment in response to the brain within its groove, but this is Dickinson week. And we do talk about it that way. And Danny invited us to think about it that way. So do you want to comment, uh, Davey and then Jake? So, sorry, Davey, before you started to jump in, but Al, there's also a really good forum, discussion forum question about the brain within its groove that dovetails nicely with what you just said. You want to read it, Anna? Yeah. So um, John Sanchez writes, is the brain within its groove an empowering poem? 
I'd like to read it that way, but oh. it seems to make the work of thinking outside the box and building new societies a mostly passive and reactive process. Wow. So okay, to dovetail great. nicely with your comment about um, the brain as you know, and reading this poem in a neuroatypical way. Yeah, wow. Kind of okay. exciting way to read. We got a lot going there. And 610-616-3208. Chris, we do have a phone call. So why don't I take, ask that person to hold on um, let's hear from Davy and Jake and then go to the phone. This is a question that came up in some respect in my office hour yesterday about what is the relationship between the flooding that occurs in the second half of the poem and the splinter swerve of, um, you might think of it as like neurodiverse thinking, that's the way that we narrate it in Modpo. And uh, that gets to John's great question in the forums, and it's something that I really feel like I'm grappling with, and I'm curious to know what others think, is does um, neuroatypical thinking in the poem cause what I'm really trying to put pressure on and read as a moment of environmental disaster? Um, what is the relationship between those things? And we've been doing sort of a more like individual scale, this is about non-normative thinking or neurodiverse thinking. But there's also the scale of the poem at the end is much larger and is really a scale of environmental destruction. And I wonder in response to John's question, how do we fit those scales together? How do we follow the poem in its shift from uh, individual cognition to um, social and environmental uh, change and rupture? Mm, good questions. Thank you. Jake, your thought on this? Yeah, I was, uh, as you were talking about this, I was uh, recalling a moment uh, in a classroom where I was um, teaching yeah, a course that's based on Matpo. And at the end, the student shared that uh, when she was very young, she was diagnosed with something. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but um, but she had, as a kid, trouble uh, finding the right word for something. And she would name maybe like 20 words around that concept, but would not be able to recall exact word. That that was the thing that she shared. She uh, experienced as a child and um, had uh, a lot of trouble just um, was uh, in a way, in a way self-conscious uh, growing up with this and and being told that it's it's a problem and uh, at the end of the course she shared that she felt that the state of poetry is a lot like that condition that uh, was described to her that the idea of the groove circling encircling something powerful something unspeakable something that there isn't the right word for is a, a sense that you get out of uh, poetry especially the kind of poetry that Emily Emily Dickinson is doing and uh, I think there's there's something about um, the state that you get into as you deeply reading poems as you writing um, writing poems that is uh, highly uh, an, an unusual um, and open um, and, and, and inviting to uh, to all the forms of thinking thank you Davy and Jake um, Chris, let's take the call and I'll ask uh, Max and Amber Rose to respond to whatever the call is asking. Sorry to put you on the spot. And Amber Rose, maybe that will give you a chance to make that comment you wanted to make. Um, Chris, who's on the phone? Uh, yes, uh, and I just want to quickly mention that we have a lot of a lot of calls coming in, fortunately, but I can only screen one at a time. Uh, okay. So if you're calling, um, please keep keep, call, calling. Uh, keep, keep calling, but I, I won't be able to take more than one call at a time. So. <laughs> Why not? Uh, what the hell yeah. is wrong with you? You can't take two calls. I know. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so we have a first time mod power, Aiden, calling from Ireland, and he's on the line now. Great. Can you hear me, Aiden? I most certainly can. Hello. Hello. Where, in Ar where in Ireland are you? I'm very close to the most northerly point on the island. In other words, Malin Head in County Donegal. Wow, but it is. It is in, in 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 geographic terms, it's the most northerly place, but in uh, political terms, it's in Southern Ireland. It's in the Republic yes. of Ireland. That's right. It's a complicated spot north on that island. Really. It's always a complicated spot. Yeah, I've, I've I've noticed that just in the last while in poetic terms, with lots of American sites that explain people's poetry, and with Seamus Heaney, they invariably miss the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, most he, poems. Yeah, well, uh, Heaney, I've noticed in the American press, Heaney is getting a lot of attention lately. I'm not sure what what caused that, but it's worth thinking about. Before we ask you to ask your question or make your comment, to which Max and Amber Rose are going to respond, can I ask you how you found Modpo? 
I'm not sure. I, 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 I remember. I, I remember getting in contact. Oh, yes, I do remember now. Um, there's a very sad case where the Poetry Foundation has a, 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 a poem on it uh, where the actor who or the person who's recorded the voice yeah. uh, actually misread the poem. Oh. Uh, and uh, I got in touch with you trying to, to uh, hoping that uh, me having yelled at the Poetry Foundation for a while and nobody having the courtesy to reply, I thought, uh, I'll look for other people. And somehow I found you and I found Mod Poe. You emailed and, uh, me out of the blue. Did I have anything helpful to say in response to the screw up at the Poetry Foundation? Not really, but you had lovely things to say. And you had recently been to Ireland and you'd said nice oh. things about Ireland. So I'm totally charmed. <laughs> ah, this is what you call individualized recruitment of learners. But there are 49,000 of yes, you. Exactly. So exactly. Well, listen, exactly. we have a little, Aiden, we have a little chat going on among the TAs, and they're exploding. I mean, somebody says, um, I hope Aiden becomes a weekly caller. Yeah. And somebody I would says... Love to, but I, I, I'll, I'll be a bit of a curmudgeon. Like, well, it sounds like... You, in this, yeah. In this first week, can I tell you why? In, in this first week, I, I was particularly interested because Emily Dickinson wasn't... Um, Somebody, you know, so she's obviously somebody huge within American culture. She yeah. was not huge within my culture, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I have loved her poetry, but that, but having watched a sort of a twenty-six minute discussion of <laughs> dwelling in the house of possibility, right? Yeah, I was amazed that there was not a single mention in the twenty minutes of talk about this lady and this wonderful poem, I thought, um, of the constraints on a woman yeah. in Amherst yeah. at the time she was writing. Yeah. Hey, uh, Aiden, uh, can I... Can courage I... of the woman to, to be a poet at that time yeah. yes. in a Calvinistic society where you weren't supposed to do things like that. Right. You know, you, you, just as in a Catholic society in Ireland, a woman right. shouldn't think of herself as a painter. She could paint as a pastime. Right. She could have a little thing like like crochet, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but she couldn't call herself a proper artist. Right. Um, she Aiden, couldn't Aiden, call herself I, a poet. Aiden, I'm gonna I'm gonna mumble some kind of uh, sorry answer to uh, the point you're making. But then what I'm yes. gonna do, uh, I'm gonna ask you to hang up and listen to the responses. Um, through the YouTube so that others can call. So yes. basically take the, take the answer, but, yes. but curmudgeon or not, we do hope you'll call back. And I'm so glad you joined us. So well, hang up and I'm gonna, I'm gonna mumble a response and I'm gonna turn to um, Amber Rose and Max. So my mumble for 70, what? Uh, for a 74 year old Irish person who's isolating since the beginning of oh. Uh, oh. March, Yes. right? Yes. Um, and missing my family, even though I like being by the beach, <laughs> but, but the rest of my family is in Dublin. Oh. And uh, to, to listen to young people and to hear uh, the discussions of Bob Poe, like I've been listening to a lot of stuff on it. You're a joy, the lot of you. You know, oh. it's great for a 74 year old. Oh. Can I, before you hang up, let me just say, will you be part of our family? Would that be okay? Oh, absolutely. I feel part of the family already, even though I've got a very shaky hand holding this oh. phone. Well, can, can, can I say that, that we love you? Is that good enough? <laughs> that's, that's very American. <laughs> oh, I knew you were going to say it. All right, curmudgeon, get off the phone. We do love you. Call again soon. We're going to do some replies. That was Aiden from Northern Ireland. Okay, so my mumbled reply on the, uh, the, on the 26 minute discussion is, we do get back, A, we do get back to the issue of Dickinson in her time by examining in week eight, Susan Howe's My Emily Dickinson, which is very much about the political and anti-feminist circumstances. Um, and second, we really try to do a close reading and try to find the historical situations in the poem. That's my mumbled response. But anyway, wow, the, our chat is exploding. Uh, people are, have just found their Irish grand, grandfather, et cetera. So uh, Amber Rose and Max, quickly a response to Aiden. And then Chris, uh, it's 610-616-3208. And Chris will have a new call by then. 
Uh, Max, you want to start and then Amber Rose? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for the call and Aiden and uh, for pointing out that oversight, I guess, in our original video. Um, yeah, just as, uh, just as an addendum to what Al said, indeed, uh, in the forums, there is a lot of, or I have seen a lot of discussion of the gender issues surrounding this poem, usually by way of our other Dickinsonians uh, that we explore in the later weeks of the course, such as Susan Howe, as Al mentioned, and also um, Lori Niedeker, who uh, we'll explore uh, sooner in the course, um, especially around the poem for closure. I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at uh, Lori Niedeker around the poem for closure. A lot of people like to go back and compare that poem to this poem because both are concerned with uh, the question of property um, and houses. Mm -hmm. And lots of people start to dig in from there into uh, the, the different ways that, that gender um, appears in both of those poems. Uh, and then that's, that sort of feeds back into a discussion of I dwell on possibility. Thank you, Max. And that's also uh, Max cheerleading for week two, in which we look at uh, modern and contemporary Dickinsonians, starting with Niedeker. And so that's great. Thank you, Max. Amber Rose, a response to Aiden. I also just want to say how much I appreciated that call and how tickled I was by him saying that you saying that you love him is very American. I yeah, I know. He, he could have said, I love you back, Al, but he had to, <clears throat> he had to turn the screw just a hey, little. Go, you American young folks. Yeah. Your feelings. Yeah. Um, Gabe was going to cry. Gabe, Al, Gabe, you're exposing Gabe. the contents of the internal chat. Okay, I, shouldn't, anyway. but I, I shouldn't, but I just be, hold, hold the thought, ARJ. Gabe, what, what about it moved you so much? Oh, no, I, Aiden is just a very funny person and, and a very jolly person and a good spirit. It was a good starting vibe, I think. Yeah, okay, thanks. Amber Rose, back to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, I think that it's great that he was able to like, that he, that jumped out at him um, before we even got into it, which does come later in the course. But I mean, I think, something that I always think about with Emily Dickinson is the restriction of movement um, and this idea of her needing to be and having to be um, inside of her home um, and the home as like this hyper domestic space. But what she reveals in her writing about her home is that it's not this kind of overly contained, um, rigid domestic space for her inside of this home is actually where she opens up and is able to gather her own paradise, is able to kind of let her mind um, be big and expansive in this context where otherwise she, and I think women in general now then, um, are seen to be sort of contained within this, within that physical space. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is one of my favorite poems that we haven't talked about so much is tell all the truth is and but tell it slant. And I think about the kind of pressure on women's speech, especially at that time, but also this pressure to be virtuous, to be honest, to be um, concise and very precise in language. And um, I love that she's sort of like, yes, I'm going to tell the truth, but you all can't take my truth if I were to really cut it, cut it clean for you. So let me kind of tell it on this other angle, which might be perceived as, um, mm -hmm. as my grandmother would say, fresh. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. I love that about Emily Dickinson and about how she sort of refuses the capture of mm -hmm. uh, domestic whatever structures. That's so well said. Thank you, Ambrose. That's wonderful. Um, we have uh, Janice on the phone, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing Janice's name. Um, but Chris, would you bring her up, please? Janice, uh, no. Al. Janice Al, you actually did a pretty good job. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Yeah, you did it right. Did can I really? hear me? Yeah, Janice, we can hear you. Um, you're from oh, Albany. Great. You're from Albany, Georgia. I remember your introduction, and you're a first-time Modpo person. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. That's Thanks. great. How did how did you find us? I was searching for um, writing classes and I found Coursera and I stumbled upon uh, Mod Poe because I love poetry, I'm a poet. 
And so I decided I would take the course because I've always really wanted to understand uh, American, uh, modern, contemporary uh, American poetry. That is really cool. And I remember you said that you, that one of your favorite poets was Langston Hughes. And mm -hmm. I'll just mention that uh, Hughes appears in week five and there's a really devastatingly fabulous poem in week five. So stay with us. Um, would you do me a favor and turn the volume down uh, on the output a little bit of your machine because we're getting a bit of an echo. Does that make sense? You mean, okay, not my cell phone, but the, oh, okay. Yeah, I think if you stay on your phone with us and listen to me, I think, Chris, she should be able to hear the TAs, right? Okay, yeah, you can turn your computer down. So I'm gonna ask Ali Castleman and Erica Kaufman to be the two to respond to whatever question or comment you have, Janice. And I hope you're enjoying the course. So glad that you joined. I'm loving it. Yeah? Yep. Great. I'm really enjoying it. Oh, that's great. Stay with us and reach out to us if you ever have trouble navigating the, the ModPost site and we'll help you. Okay, so what's your question or comment? And Allie and Erica will answer. Okay, um, for all my life, Dickinson has been a struggle for me to understand her, um, her many layers of meaning. But I was, um, uh, my question has to do with I Dwell in Possibility. In the uh, last stanza, she talks about the fair visitors. The, um, that the fair visitors of uh, poetry, you know, the house uh, poetry being better than prose. Yeah. But, uh, the fair visitors, uh, she's basically excluding. And what I'm asking is, who is she excluding besides the fair visitors? Whoa. Janice, you, you should be a TA in this course. You got right to the big issue, I think. Pretty fabulous. Oh, thanks. Cool. Um, so I'm going to ask if you don't mind hanging up and then turn your volume back up on your computer so you can hear the responses. And I hope you'll call back and participate lots in the course as we go forward. Okay, well, thank you, Al. Thanks, Janice, good to talk to you. 610-616-3208, um, okay. Janice is uh, off the phone and you can call, anybody can call or Skype Modpo Pen. Allie and then Erica, boy, oh boy, Janice really got right to it. You know, this is the thing that we really try to work through that the fairest seems to exclude people. Allie? Um, yeah, I don't know how satisfactory of an answer I can give to this. Um, and if you haven't checked out um, Al's Canon Challenge um, video, uh, he kind of raises the question there. The way that I, that I um, think about kind of getting around this, um, is kind of concerned with the idea of um, part of what Erica was talking about earlier um, and part of what you mentioned in um, there's kind of, uh, it takes a while to get into Dickinson. There's um, a kind of barrier uh, between any, uh, or at least many readers um, and her work. Um, and so one way that I've thought about a visitor's the fairest um, is a kind of almost just like self-identifying, um, like self-selected group, right? So if you count yourself to be one of those, um, if you count yourself to be one of those fair visitors who wants to dwell in the house of possibility with Emily Dickinson, um, I, I like to uh, believe that um, she has room in that enormous house um, for all those people who are kind of patient um, enough to be in there. Um, but, you know, the word fairest is certainly um, troubling. So that's one, that's one thought that I have around it. Thank you, Allie. Um, as we turn to Erica, I'll just note that Tan in Siberia, who basically agrees with what Allie just said, writes in Twitter, I feel like when Dickinson talks about her house, she also talks about not, not letting just everyone in. You have to truly work on being honored with being really let in, so that there's there's work supposedly involved um, in, in both ways. And, and by the way, Jerry, Jeremy Dixon writes, ah, oh, Anna and her baby is giving me all the Modpo live feels. So there you go. Hi, baby. Could you wanna introduce this little Modpoet? Yeah, I'm a mom now, you guys. <laughs> Pretty weird. 
<laughs> this is Sylvie. <laughs> Can we get a close up? Uh, Sylvie is really snoozling. Yeah, she she I was feeding her a few minutes ago and she fell back asleep. So she'll wake oh. up in a little bit. Oh piss her off. Adorable. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. That's great. Erica Kaufman, your thoughts on the exclusion. Um you know, maybe maybe this is wishful thinking and this might be kind of running counter to how I would normally approach reading a poem, but I I really want to believe that the fairest of visitors, the fairest for occupation has to do with word work and is maybe a meta poetic um, moment in the poem. So in other words, you know, like what, what Tan was saying about, you know, really having to work work on language or work on who is occupying space, you know, instead of being exclusive, I almost want the Ferris to be inclusive in the way that I read the last two lines of the poem, which is spreading wide my narrow, my narrow hands to gather paradise. Mm. Nice. Um, what I'd like to do is, um, wait until the next call comes in and invite Lily, Anna, Jess, and Jason to respond to that each briefly. But before that, what I'd like to do is play a very short clip from Divya Victor's W is for Walt Whitman's Soul, just to put into the record of this live conversation, the sound of that voice, the sound of that extraction accumulation and ask, ask folks here and just wave at me or indicate in the chat if you have a comment. Um, some people have wrestled with this poem, certainly the students at Penn. Um, they're trying to figure out what Divya Victor is saying through that voice about the Whitmanian catalog. Um, what kind of position is Divya with, uh, Victor taking through her own exercise of accumulation. So here's just a couple of seconds of that. It's varnished by suns sitting on bronze and sugared with saltpeter, its torso, a tableau for the annals of rectitude, the theater for roiling or robust passage, a veritable Suez Canal to its missionary victories, which thrust from such bejeweled and oiled loins anointed by coin, that emission of plump lums, lump sumps into the Ganges, that coiling coy virgin maiden winding her languid locks, batting her lashes to its lashes, its spine a gentle wire. It goes on, it's amazing, what a performance. Um, Jess, I know you have a thought about this and then Jake. <laughs> How do you know that, Al? I was watching your expression. <laughs> um, all right, I'll accept that. Um, hello, everyone. Hello, friends. Hi, yes. um, it's great to be with you all again, and um, it was great to it was great to hear that. Um, it really a, an incredible um, performance. Um, it's quite a challenge to read that poem out loud, um, and I guess my um, my thought about it, um, the, maybe the first thought that entered into my head as, as I read it for the first time was that um, the Whitmanian song, um, this gesture of, 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 a, uh, of a collective song or a song that speaks for all or speaks in some kind of collective voice is being um, replaced here in a really powerful way by a kind of appetite, a kind of rapacious, uh, consuming um, of otherness <laughs> in, in, in so many words. And, and, and that is what struck me, I guess, about this Whoa. is the, the imagery of, of, of consumption and appetite and, and visceral, uh, a, kind of, a kind of visceral gathering Mm. in a kind of a way and that and that and that struck me as as a very powerful response to the um to the, the song and and the voice so tell me if i'm getting this wrong 
somehow Divya Victor is able to replicate the rapaciousness of the accumulation and the extraction. And, uh, but at the same time, make it clear that she's, she's critiquing that rapacity. It's a pretty hard thing to do. Yeah, I, I think she's making the critique of the Whitmanian, uh, you know, sort of the all-inclusive voice as actually a very violent consumption of, of otherness in a way. I mean, um, it makes me think of this idea uh, from bell hooks of eating the other, yes. right? The racial other, the, you know, mm. the, the sort of marginalized other, mm. um, because there is this kind of convergence of like stuff <laughs> yeah. and like human bits, <laughs> right? In, in the poem that I think is meant to be, you know, kind of unsettling and, and, and used in a critical way. In the passage that I played, it happened that we heard this key moment where Divya Victor describes the, the poetry she's responding to as a veritable Suez Canal itself, which is, of course, the human uh, uh, commercially reason built uh, way of moving that which is extracted through a tiny port and outward to the Western world. Um, and so it is a kind of technology that ena enables that rap rapaciousness to happen, but it is also this narrow opening. Um, Jake, when, when you were listening to Divi Victor, you were, I could tell you were essentially channeling the performance poet. Um, I, I felt that you were really into the rhythm of it, thinking about, um, the ideal performance. Am I wrong? Uh, no, you're not wrong. But um, even um, as um, I, I was also listening to Jess's comment just just now and, and really appreciating it uh, because um, I, I thought that was illuminating and, and, and made made a lot of sense. Uh, the otherness in this poem, like this is a, a poem about um, oh, oh, the soul to India. Right. You're talking about India with in English and in, in, in conversation potentially with with Whitman um, obviously the, the questions of otherness are going to be central here and uh, I also really appreciated uh, just what you said about connection to song like just this basically sounds like a song and and um, just uh, reminded me of that uh, Ginsburg poem called song this is what I wanted but I always wanted to come back to this body uh, it's very bodily like I, I was just um, in the groove of this, um, and, and I felt like I was moving with with her voice and with this poem, and 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 that um, and 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 that 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 movement and free association and being led by sound um, to explore uh, something that's that's that, that's hidden or, or, or repressed or, or difficult to say. Um, that's that that feels like what's what's happening here, and then this is what's unleashing to me uh, the catalog. Great. Great. What I want to do next is I want to ask Anna and um, Lily to look at the uh, YouTube comments, uh, ARJ to look at the Facebook comments, Anna to look at the forums, and let's pull out some interesting things. And I'll ask Jason to listen hard to all these and respond to just one of them. Pick out one that really gets you going, Jason. So let's turn to Lily first. Something interesting going on in the YouTube chat? Okay, well, the YouTube chat is really exploding and I'm having a lot of fun um, talking with everyone in there. So um, people were really um, excited about this conversation about um, I dwell in possibility. They loved um, hearing Erica say that she wasn't a big Dickinson fan at first. Um, someone actually wanted us to go around and say if we have shifted our views as like a panel on any week one poems. Like, was there something you hated at the beginning and mm -hmm. now you like it a lot? Um, and so Juliet Vandermolen was talking a lot about um, coded speech and telling it slants, like coded speech based on gender roles. Um, let's see. Um, Scott Day was hoping we would talk about that distinction between poetry and prose. Mm. Um, from the poem, which we didn't quite talk about. Um, I really like this comment that Danny Witte just made, um, that Divya's reading uh, of her poem was so agitated as if the words hurt. Mm -hmm. um, really beautiful. Wow. And Who made the comment? 
sorry, can you say that again? Who made that comment, Lily? Danny Witty. In, in oh, Danny Witty, the aforementioned, yep. Mm -hmm. Great. And, yeah, there's lots of great combo. They're yeah. kind of just catching up to um, W for What Women Soul. Wow, so uh, we, we promise to keep an eye on YouTube comment streams from now on Yes. Uh, this season. We haven't done as much of that in the past as we should. Anna, um, anything in the um, in the forum uh, worth mentioning? There's it looks like a lot in there that I'm looking at. So much, um, so many great comments and questions. Um, one that I think we should definitely get to is there's a couple of folks wondering about our new Canon challenge videos mm -hmm. and our Canon challenge sort of as a syllabus practice. So maybe Lily wants to talk about that. <laughs> Lily, um, can I? Can I? What I'd like to do is just defer on the Canon Challenge for a yep. second and ask Lily and David to comment each on that a little later. Yep. But I'm glad because I saw I saw people. Uh, something else to throw out from the uh, from the forums? Sure. Um, Susan Waldrop brought up a really good point when we were talking about exclusivity in Emily Dickinson, reminding us that Emily Dickinson, her family had servants and her family was powerful and wealthy. And like we should definitely think about Dickinson's own privilege when we think about you know, even though she was living in a time when uh, certainly, you know, she was not as able to take advantage of some of those familial privileges as maybe men in her family were. Um, sorry, excuse me. Um, but uh, it is important to remember that she did have wealth status and political power and more education than most. A um, couple of folks wondering about how to catch up with the webcast. We will, we always post recordings of these on the same place where you found the stream. Um, and yeah, lots of just excitement about Divya Victor as well. Great, okay, Amber Rose Johnson, what's happening in Facebook? Yes, okay, um, in Facebook, Mandana, um, our good friend Mandana just made a comment uh, that says, I do think we need to be even more frank about the issues of empire Empire's external gazes and plundering of the others in this brilliant Divya Victor poem. Mm -hmm. um, so yes to that. And I think also just yes to pushing ourselves to be even more frank about the critiques that these poems are bringing forward mm -hmm. now and forevermore in Modpo. <laughs> um, and another comment from a new Modpoer named Lori who says, so surprised and grateful this is real and not a money grabbing scheme actually crying over here. The existence of this narrows the gap between privileged and underprivileged. I can't believe it's been going on for nine years and I've only just gleaned it. So welcome to you, Lori. And yes, closing the gap, bringing high quality conversation and co-thinking to the masses. Wow. Amber Rose, you should take over the hosting job. <laughs> you were so good at it. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. That was great. Oh, that's so gratifying, Lori, because we do put a lot of effort into this. Um, Jason, so much there that you could respond to, but pick pick one and and uh, let's hear your thoughts. Um, Hi, Jason. Hey. Good to um, see you. It's good to see you too. And um, I uh, trying to call something up on my computer really quick. Where to go? Um, I need uh, someone else to quickly pull up uh, uh, can uh, Whitman's Canto. Um, which which one is it? The canto where he welcomes the slave, which is one that we don't read. <laughs> uh, do you remember the number? Uh, I, I just had it on my screen and uh, now it is, let's see. Uh, oh, I got it. Okay. It is uh, canto, it's a super long canto. Uh, it's 32. 32. Can you read a couple of the lines and, and um, comment? Yeah, that? I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's uh, crucial, especially in what we're talking about 
uh, I think it, it's crucial in triangulating Whitman with uh, Divya Victor's poem and the question of the, the fairest visitors. Um, uh, uh, so uh, basically a long way, way, way deep into the canto, um, he says, uh, uh, the mother of old uh, condemned for which burnt with dry wood, her children gazing on the hounded slave that flags in the race, leans by the fence, blowing, covered with sweat, the twinges that sting like needles, his legs and neck, the murderous buckshot and the bullets, all these I feel or am. I am the hounded slave, I wince at the bite of the dogs, hell and despair are upon me, crack and again, crack the marksman, I clutch the rails of the fence, my gorge ribs, thinned with the ooze of my skin, I fall on the weeds and the stones, the riders spur their unwilling horses, haul close, taunt my dizzy ears and beat me violently over the head with whip stocks. Agonies are one of my changes of garments. I do not ask the wounded person how he feels. I myself become the wounded person. But then uh, there's, I can't remember where else in the poem it is. Uh, I will find it and post it some in my off office hours tomorrow night, um, where there is actually a uh, escaped slave who comes to yes. Whitman's house and Whitman welcomes in the slave, treats him with complete uh, e equality of respect, feeds him, clothes him, and, and kind of gives him, and, and shelters him for a kind of indefinite amount of time. Um, that isn't a scene I picture happening at the Dickinson home. Yeah. Um, but I think that, uh, that we tend to, uh, focus on Whitman's kind of, uh, kind of uh, proto uh, late 20th century um, American consumption of everything um, into this kind of devouring like gargantua pentacle mm -hmm. figure. Right. Um, and I, uh, I think there are, and that's kind of a, a reading that we've given over and over again over the years, which I, um, the more I read song of myself over and over again, the less I agree with. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, what, what, uh, So uh, what distinguishes Whitman and Dickinson to me is a certain relationship to uh, materiality and um, Whitman having a kind of um, kind of almost like post transcendental uh, mat materiality in which he like the this the I as the speaker, I don't. I mean, yes, it's like I as everyone, yeah. But it's also I as everything, yeah. Um, and uh, it it is to me. I I the more I read it, song of myself, the more I read it as a a voice from the dead or the voice of uh, mater materiality itself as something continuously in flux 
mm -hmm. and, and taking new form. Jason, thank you for that counter reading. Um, we, we don't have time right now to follow it up, but we should because it's an important, it's an important thing. Right. Uh, we, have, we have one person on the phone. We're going to take a last call. It's Megan from Dallas, right, Chris? We're going to take a call. I'm going to ask Lily and Anna to respond briefly to Megan. And then I have a couple of questions to ask the whole group. We can go around and get some quick answers and final thoughts. So Chris, Megan's on the line. You want to bring Megan, Megan up? on the line, yeah. Hey, yeah, Hi, hello. Hi, Megan. How, how are you? Hi, all. Great. I'm a poet. Um, I'm here and a poet in my own right, but just kind of know that woman. Um, but I have read these words over and over, and I've sung some of them as well. Um, I participated in a couple of concerts in 2019 um, in New York, where I was living before. And uh, you know, there's such beauty in these words. And I'm finding that in the backdrop of the pandemic, that there's a different perspective that I have on them. So I kind of wanted to ask you and ask the group what your thoughts are on being these words from Dickinson, who spent a lot of her time inside in her house, and Whitman, who I find his words to be so internalized sometimes, and pull some quotes out. If you're dwelling in possibility, if you're dwelling, then what does that possibility look like? Or, you know, with Whitman, I celebrate myself, I sing myself, I think that as a singer and primarily in choruses, that singing alone has such a different feeling than singing in a group of people where you have that sense of unity in person and going to Whitman with the brain within its group can deeper in. So are you thinking about these words and now than you have before? Um, Megan, I, I take some of some of what you said was broken up by bad connection, but I take it that you're talking about two things at least. One is the whole question of your own relationship to this poetry by as a singer. Um, and the other is about the relationship between this poetry and the experience we've all had being isolated because of the pandemic. Um, is this, by the way, is this your first time in Modpo? This is, yeah. Great. I just want to welcome you and, and hope that uh, you'll stay with us all 10 weeks and beyond. Um, would you, would you uh, listen to the responses uh, after you hang up? And thanks for calling. Thank you, Michael. Okay, great, Megan. Okay, Lily and Anna, uh, respond in any way uh, to uh, what you were able to make out from Megan's questions, comments. Lily first. Yeah, um, I think like to restate a little bit, I guess I interpreted Megan's question as like, is there a pandemic related context that gives new thought to Dickinson and Whitman from this, um, from uh, as represented in week one. Um, and uh, I would say definitely, yes. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely like feeling still pretty energized from the conversation Anna and I had with our face-to-face um, -face class yesterday about dwelling in possibility and um, the sense of like creating a, creating a landscape to operate in from just being stuck in one place, so to speak, or mm. from being mainly inside one area and like learning how to reorient life so that you're finding a lot more fulfillment from intellectual exploration than I might've been used to, you know, like having some more social time or being able to be out there experiencing things. And yeah, I've just been really thinking a lot about the distinctions between, we have tended to draw between Dickinson and Whitman of like, personally, physically experiencing something versus thought experiencing something. Um, and just kind of realizing that that's sort of a false dichotomy in a way, because yeah. even Whitman himself was thought experiencing a lot of the stuff that he wrote about. So yeah. that's where my Great. mind's at. Thank you. Anna, your thought? I've been thinking an awful lot um, about how this is something that happens to me every year at the beginning of my pose that I feel like my relationships with the poems like have radically changed. Um, there was the question in the YouTube chat also earlier, Lily, that, that I was thinking about how, you know, have, have your like opinions of any of these poems changed? And like, 
I really think that um, the great thing about studying these particular poems time and time and time again is that you kind of meet a new version of yourself every time you re-meet these poems because the poems don't change, but like you do as a person mm -hmm. and therefore your reading experience of the poems like changes and changes the way that you experience them and read them and think about them and study them. And that comes from, you know, both learning more about yourself and about the world and the way it works. You know, I certainly feel like I'm a totally different person than I was when I was 21, when I first, you know, was participating in those round table discussions. And that's like a really gratifying experience. Um, a, a really wonderful way to continue to sort of like figure myself out through reading these great poems. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think every time we come back there and if we're reading the poems by uh, experiencing them more through music or more through reading, um, if you read it out loud versus read it quietly to yourself, if you read it to someone else or have someone else read it to you, um, there's a lot, a lot of different ways to, to access these poems um, and to kind of rediscover them in the return. True, and, and Megan, uh, thank you for uh, asking your question and I hope that you're able to get singing in front of the public again soon. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna wrap up with light, two lightning rounds. And by lightning round, I mean, you know, 20 second comment from each. Uh, for the first lightning round is, and we'll go, we'll ask everybody to make this suggestion. Um, what's a tip, especially for new ModPo people for navigating or exploring the ModPo site? Dealing, it could be a technical thing about how to, you know, cut a corner or a hack. Could also be a suggestion about something that they may not know exists. Okay, so I'm going to start with Lily and we'll go around. Lily, quick suggestion. Okay, the search bar in the discussion forum is your friend. So if you are reading something and you're like, I really want to talk about this particular word from the poem or a topic, try putting it in the search bar and seeing if you can get connected really fast with the forum or with a thread where someone's already talking about that topic. Um, it'll just make your life a lot easier. Great. And the search function has improved over the years. Uh, so it works pretty well. And if you know the phrase, put it in quotation marks and you'll really get a result. Allie Castleman. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, don't feel um, confined to like the order of the syllabus every week. I would say um, one way to get a lot out of the course is to like let a splinter swerve in your own exploration. So if you find yourself um, really like attracted to like a particular piece um, and you want to go more into like Modpo Plus to see like what else is like very closely adjacent there. Mm -hmm. um, don't worry about any sort of like linearity really from week to week because um, all these things are so connected and just kind of, you know, go with your own flow mm -hmm. of interest. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Jess. Uh, yeah. The, the course is still new to me. So um, in terms of navigating the site, I don't have expertise, but what I will say is that um, one of the great things about ModPo for me is that if there's a poem that I'm like, I don't have a way into this poem, how do I get into it? Um, you can be assured that there is someone somewhere on the forum saying something, someone's gonna have a way in. And I think um, having access to all of these ideas, perspectives that um, you might not have thought of otherwise is a great thing. So just there's, there's reason to be um, heartened, I think, by that. Great, thank you. Max McKenna. Take advantage of our office hours. Um, we all have weekly office hours stop by. We're happy to answer any kind of question um, on any subject most of the time. So if you're lost, if you need a way in, just uh, find us there. Fantastic, thank you. Erica Kaufman. I was gonna also echo office hours. I think they're super helpful. And if you're in the discussion forums, I always find the sorting function so you can just make sure that the things, the conversations that are the most recent are at the top, that always helps me. Fantastic, Gabe. 
Yeah, um, I was gonna say one of the many heads of this Hydra is uh, the audio files that we have of people reading um, the poems. And sometimes it's a nice and appealing way of getting into a week's material is to just like look for those listen. It says like reading colon listen usually. Um, looking for those can sometimes give you a flavor of a week um, in a way that doesn't take a lot of work. You can do other stuff while you're listening to them. And if you want to just kind of live with that for a little bit, we also, you know, the, a lot of the people in this group, a lot of, especially Chris and Zach and Al, work really hard on pen sound, which you can Google. And if you have an author uh, who we would have recordings of, so not really like Dickinson, um, <laughs> you can find more recordings by that person reading their work. Um, and that's just such a great archive. Fantastic. Dave Poplar. Short comments are fine in discussion forums. Don't feel pressure to compose an essay with a middle or an end or multiple points. If you come up with a connection, something that uh, seems interesting or a question about a poem, just post it, uh, get involved, jump in. It doesn't have to be uh, an essay, it could be anything. Hey Dave, a follow up on that. A lot of people say, well, I did Modpo, but I never posted because I was always so nervous about that. Everybody seemed to know everything. and. And I, I'm a little shy. What what would you say? I mean, obviously, people can do the course without using the discussion forums. But what would you say to encourage people? Yeah, I mean, I'm sympathetic to that. I mean, I think everybody has that. I mean, sitting around the table recording the videos with everybody else, I was I was very conscious of everybody saying really smart things. But um, everybody has something different to add, and you because it's your own your own comment. Mm -hmm don't realize how interesting it will be for everybody else, but just share it and it will be enlightening for so many people. I can almost promise you that. Great. Uh, Jason, before you offer your hack, um, in the Twitter feed, uh, Sanjeev posted the text to Canto 33, Song of Myself, which is what you were reading from. And Ray Maxwell uh, contributed the documentation confirmation that Walt Whitman was running a station on the undergraduate uh, undergraduate un, on the underground railroad, which you know obviously I'm running a station on the undergraduate railroad. Yeah, but uh, that the uh, the um, no, I think I think that's really important to remember about Whitman is his uh, that very fact of yeah. how he was not just writing and establishing a career, but uh, actively helping people seeking freedom. Yep. Your, um, uh, your uh, recommendation for, uh, you know, getting through, navigating Modpo? Um, my recommendation is to definitely, like everyone else has said, go mm -hmm. to office hours and, um, also to <clears throat> not worry at all about um, being right. <laughs> um, you know, each, each of us, you know, most of us have, have been here for years and years. And uh, I don't think anything I've ever said has been right. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Like, uh, but I keep saying things. <laughs> I love that. Thank and uh, and and uh, it's 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 kind of like the course depends on the the making your own language available because you have no idea of what I'm, I'm echoing what has already been said. You have no idea of what. Uh, uh, like billiard ball uh, <laughs> impact it's gonna have on someone else's thinking. Even if it seems absurd to you, just just get it out there, put it out, put it yeah. outside of your brain, put it- I love that approach. Put it out. That's a beautiful approach, totally. Um, Ambrose Johnson, is there a technique, a navigation hint, a hack, suggestion? Yeah, two really quick things. Um, the first, just to add to Jason, um, sorry about the construction. I don't know if you can hear it. We can't hear it, no, it's fine. Okay, cool. 
So to add to Jason, not just don't worry about being right, but also I want to add, don't worry about being prepared. Mm. Um, because I think those things go hand in hand and sometimes feeling like you're not prepared can produce the feeling of not being right. But be reminded that you showing up, whether that be showing up to the webcast or showing up in the forums or showing up in discussion some other way, with just your lived experience is truly all the preparation you need to be able to close read a poem um, and talk to folks about it. So that, and then the other thing really quickly um, is because ModPo can feel so big, it can be a little, a little intimidating, but once you start posting, that's like you carving out a little pathway and then you'll be able to start having interactions and it'll start to feel smaller kind of around you and your experience. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, actually the best way to get rid of that feeling is to jump in with a post <laughs> and shrink the size down to a conversation that'll become just you and some other people. Uh, great suggestion, thank you. These are all great suggestions. Davey? Something I love about MobPo is that it's a community of teachers that so many people have an informal or formal relationship to education, uh, which is to say that when you're uh, in the process of, as Ambrose was describing, shrinking your experience of the course down, you're surrounded by teachers to whom you can ask questions. And um, MobPo folks are uh, generally uh, very, very helpful and generous. And so if there's stuff you're confused about, feel free to ask anybody. There's more than 100 CTAs. There's the teaching staff. There are many folks who've been in the course for eight or nine years and they all just want folks to feel comfortable and like that's what we all want from the course is a space where people are like nice to each other and help each other think and so uh, feel free to ask anything um also feel free to do 10 minutes feel free to read one poem uh, don't feel like you have to do any particular amount but feel free to like drop in for a minute and um as ambrose is saying find your way through the material as gabe is saying um start by listening to the material um, and finally, don't feel like you have to agree with us. Feel free to push us on things. Feel free to say no to some things we say in the videos. Feel free to offer other readings. Uh, we are offering one way into the poems in our conversations and we disagree with ourselves as Anna was saying. And um, we invite you to come disagree with us. That's a really wonderful way to have a conversation. Yeah, we can take it too. We're, we want that. Anna, uh, advice, navigation, hack. Um, we have a handy FAQ and audio guide um, that's accessible if you go to resources on the left-hand menu um, and scroll to FAQ and audio guide that answers a lot of the like most often asked questions. But if you are still stuck and still curious and still, or just mm -hmm. wanna reach out, um, you can email us at modpo, M-O-D-P-O at uh, writing.upenn.edu. Great, good suggestion. I was going earlier to ask us to go around and talk about how people can stay with the course, but I think we're running out of time. What I'm gonna do is, and, and rather than final words, what I'm gonna do is ask each of you, and we're talking about one instance, and it's gotta be brief, um, to, to toss out something that's coming up in the course, not just week two, but beyond, something that will excite people and encourage them to stay, a poem, a discussion, an issue. So Gabe, sorry to call on you first, What's coming up that should draw people in and keep them there? Um, the heart of the New York school. Yeah, okay, great. I love that, a phrase. And that is week seven. Okay, Lily. I'm just laughing at Gabe's like very brief and enigmatic statement. Just is really that enigmatic? I think he, heart, meaning he meant the emotional. Enigmatic was the wrong word. It was just very concentrated, I liked it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say that um, I am excited to um, talk about Laureen Niedeker next week. I know that's only one week away, but I just really love her, and I'm excited for that. Cool. Allie Castleman. Why should thinking people about, stay? Thinking about Gertrude Stein right now. Um, wow. To, to just talk about uh, poems that are that it's a good idea to listen to them um, mm. as your first point of access. That'll really help. Yeah, we, that's week four. And we, we always say we see a fall off in week four as people are intimidated by Gertrude Stein. And we're all here to say, you don't have to be intimidated by Gertrude Stein. It's, you can do it. Davey. 
Uh, I want to shout out the Canon challenges. We'll talk more about it in future weeks, but if uh, either you're new to the course or you're doing it again, uh, these are short videos that we've added that ask us to think differently about who's part of that week and what it means for those folks to be there and ask us to uh, think about how we build an archive and how we talk about what modern contemporary U.S. poetry is. So check those out. Yeah. So we have, uh, and Lily join in, we just might as well, Davey, explain what it is now. Uh, we have embedded in the middle of the main syllabi for each week, a short video called a Canon Challenge. And there are four of the 10 weeks in, and we have our colleagues, TAs, working on others. So four are done. Uh, there's one in there for week one, that was me, kind of a meta Canon Challenge or meta meta. Um, and then I think week two is Lily's, yep. And Anna did week three, and Davey did, I believe, week seven. Yep. So um, exactly what Davey said, and Davey and Lily and I were, I guess it was their idea, but we were chatting over the summer, and we thought this would be a good way to cause reflection about how the syllabus is actually constructed so that we didn't give, don't give the wrong impression that, it, that the canon falls from the sky and it just is. It's a developing thing that we agonize about constantly. Lily, you want to add a thought about the Canon Challenge? I'm going to say a super quick thing that I hope will spark some more maybe office hour convo, but a really interesting thing came up in the YouTube chat where someone said, um, was begrudging us a little bit for judging Dickinson and Whitman by 2020 standards. And so I'd like to say that I like the Canon Challenges kind of give us some of the framing and the meta canonical language to address that issue. So yeah. what do we do with the fact that people from a long time ago are writing poems that we still have deeply influenced the work that comes later and that still we read very widely today? How do we reconcile our contemporary thinking with what happened in the past? Great, well said. Dave, let's get back to a suggestion about something coming up soon or later that you would, that, that you would recommend that should keep people here. I just think next week's going to be a fun week because we get to see a lot of uh, subsequent poets to Dickinson and uh, Whitman who have used them as influences. So we're going to really get to see uh, the evolution of these proto-modernistic styles in action. It's going to be fun to see that happen. Great. And that is week two. Fantastic. Jess. Well, Allie already mentioned Gertrude Stein. So, and that was, that was going to be my answer, um, predictably. Um, another poet whose work I'm excited to revisit in Modpo is Gwendolyn Brooks. Yeah. And that's week five. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're all just crazy about Brooks more and more and more of the poems, uh, boy breaking glass. You know, I think some of us would nominate it as the best poem in the course, whatever that means. Amazing, Max. The Mazostic Generator, nobody doesn't love it. Yeah, week nine, now that'll keep you. Wow, the Mazostomatic, I think it's called or something like that. <laughs> Thank you. Jason, what's coming up that you'd recommend? Um, what's coming up is uh, two things. One is if uh, Divya Victor's uh, kind of foregrounding of her troubled relationship to being a poet writing in English with an uneasy relationship with English, um, you will uh, find that hand held at the end of the course by Tracy Morris. Mm -hmm. And um, in week eight, if you can guess how many books are behind me, Dave, and Erica, you win a copy of uh, every book in that course. Every book. Okay, cool. So yeah. send in your guesses. Somebody needs to count. Yeah, and I, I just bought uh, Gwendolyn Brooks in the Mecca, which uh, I've only seen for hundreds of dollars. And I, I just found like a $15 copy. And I'm I can't wait. <laughs> Great. Fantastic. Anna, recommendation for the future of this course, why people should stay. Coming up tomorrow, Thursday, 
you have office hours from Max McKenna, Erica Kaufman, Jason Zuzga, and then on Fridays, so starting this Friday, you have Jess Schellenberger and Alec Castleman. And that is worth staying for, for sure. 100%. Fantastic. And then come back around next Monday and say hi to me. And how do you find them? You go to the left side menu, you click resources, you look for office hours, and the office hours are not only scheduled, but linked. And we're linking basically to sub forums where people create threads. Fantastic. We are real. We're here. We're in the present. This is not a been there, done that MOOC that got filmed nine years ago and was left to die. We're real. We're present. Erica, thoughts about the future of the course? Um, predictably, I, I want to say Stein and how once we hit Stein in week four, um, the difference begins to spread. And then I love week eight, where we begin to circle back with uh, Susan Howe and Emily Dickinson. And then the brilliant Harriet Mullen, Tyrone Williams, John Keane. There's just so much good stuff that just keeps building and building. Fantastic. Amber Rose Johnson. I, it's no secret that week eight is one of my favorites, but I also really love week seven and I'm particularly excited about the Mod Po Plus for week seven, um, breaking beats and breaking out of conformity. Um, there are great poems from uh, Jane Cortez and from Doug Kearney, who I love, um, and just a lot of fun that happens in that particular week. And Mod Po Plus in general is this ever expanding labyrinth of resources um, that gets more and more fun as time goes on. So if you ever feel bored in the regular syllabus, jump over to Mod Po Plus, and I'm sure you'll find something that will feel exciting. Thank you all for uh, th those of you who've been watching today and especially to my pals here. Uh, thank you, Gabe, so much. We hope things work out at home for you. He's got a cat who has to pull through some things and we, 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 yeah, that's right. Li what Lily, yes, lots of heart for the cat. And Lily, thank you as always. Allie, great to see you. Davey, thank you so much. Dave Poplar, stay cool. Jess, fantastic. Thank you, Max, Jason, Anna, Sylvie. Hello, Sylvie. Wake up, Sylvie. Sylvie. Oh, get a little eye rubbing. Erica, Amber Rose, Jake had to leave early. Aiden from Ireland, Janice from Al Albany, Georgia. Uh, Megan from Dallas, both Dannys, but in particular, Danny Witte, our, our new pal. Uh, Richelle from Jakarta, uh, thank you so much for being part of Monpo and for being so smart. Kathy D in Twitter says, great advice from the panel about forums. Close your eyes, jump in and find a kindred spirit. And we are that, if nothing else. Zach Hardner, who's not visible, is doing the video. It's a marvel what he's able to do and Chris Martin, who is visible. It's also a marvel. They're, they're working from home. I don't know how they do it. And Chris integrates the audio seamlessly. We are so grateful. Uh, we will be back a week from today at a different time of day. Meantime, go to the office hours, finish up reading week one, start reading week two, and have a great week and take care of yourselves. Bye. Oh, we're getting a, we're, are we getting a wave from the baby? <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Wave to your friends, everybody. See you next time.